Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of A Ring World by Larry Niven, winner of the Hugo and Nebula Awards for the year's best science fiction novel published by Sphere Science Fiction. Dane reads. Do we have a blurb? I don't think, oh, we do have a little blurb. So I'm going to read you the little blurb. Then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, uh, with Ringworld, Larry Niven joins the elite circle of authors, which includes Isaac Asimov, Frank Herbert, and Ursula Le Guin, who have won with one of their novels both the major trophies of the science fiction world, the coveted Hugo and Nebula Awards. Um, that's not really a blurb of what to expect from the book. Basically, astronauts and space and science fiction uh, and there's a ring world, it's basically like a big metal disc that circ uh, circles around a sun. Um, which I'll, I'll talk some more about in a little bit. There's a great line here right at the start of the first chapter. Uh, had they realised yet that he had walked out on his own party, they would assume that a woman had gone with him, that he would be back in a couple of hours. But Louis Wu had gone alone, jumping ahead of the midnight line, hotly pursued by the new day. 24 hours was not long enough for a man's 200th birthday. So I think just there it does a great job of sort of setting the scene. And we get a joke here. <laughs> hey Louis, why does it take three Jinxians to paint a skyscraper? Why does it? Why does what? The Jinxians? Oh, it takes one to hold the paint sprayer and two to shake the skyscraper up and down. I heard that one in kindergarten and there's a weapon uh, called a TASP in it uh, that induces pleasure and someone says, oh wow, that's beautiful, that's lovely. So they have this kind of weapon which uh, induces pain and I just think this is quite interesting. Oh wow, that's beautiful, that's lovely. Who but a puppeteer would go around with a weapon that does good to the enemy? Who but a prideful sophisticate would fear too much pleasure? The puppeteer's quite right, says Speaker to Animals. I would not risk the task again. Too many jolts from the puppeteer's task would leave me his willing slave. I, Xin, slave to an herbivore. It's an herbivore because Americans don't pronounce the H, they say her herb herbivore. But we would say herbivore in the UK so it would be a herbivore. Uh, we get a reference to how many people currently live on Earth, which is 18 billion. So I always find it interesting when sci-fi novels list the world population, because sci-fi writers tend to know that population is growing out of control. According to Isaac Asimov, I think it's within the next 9,000 years, uh, if population growth doesn't stop, then the mass of human beings will be more than the mass of the universe. Great line here, the gods do not protect fools. Fools are protected by more capable fools. And we get a little bit about um, Dyson Spheres. So I'm just going to read this passage out because I think this is interesting. This is based on real science. You tried to tell me about Dyson Spheres, said Teela. And you told me to go pick lice out of my hair. Lewis had found a description of Dyson Spheres in the ship's library. Excited by the idea, he had made the mistake of interrupting Teela's game of solitaire to tell her about it. Tell me now, she coaxed. Go pick lice out of your hair. She waited. You win, said Louis. For the past hour he had been staring broodingly out at the ring. He was as bored as she was. I tried to tell you that the ring world is a compromise, an engineering compromise between a Dyson sphere and a normal planet. Dyson was one of the ancient natural philosophers, pre-belt, almost pre-atomic. He pointed out that civilization is limited by the energy available to it. The way for the human race to use all the energy within its reach, he said, is to build a spherical shell around the sun and trap every ray of sunlight. Now, if you'll quit giggling for just a minute, you'll see the idea. The Earth traps only about half a billionth of the sun's output. If we could use all that energy... Well, it wasn't crazy then. There wasn't even a theoretical basis for faster than light travel. We never did invent hyperdrive, if you'll recall. We'd never have discovered it by accident either, because we'd never have thought to do our experiments out beyond the singularity. Suppose an outsider ship hadn't stumbled across a United Nations ram robot. Suppose the fertility laws hadn't worked out. With a trillion human beings standing on each other's shoulders and the ram ships the fastest thing around, how long could we get along on fusion power? We'd use up all the hydrogen in Earth's oceans in a hundred years. But there's more to a Dyson sphere than collecting solar power. Say you make the sphere one astronomical unit in radius. You've got to clear out the solar system anyway, so you use all the solar planets in the construction. That gives you a shell of, say, chrome steel a few yards thick. Now you put gravity generators all over the shell. You'd have a surface area a billion times as big as the Earth's surface. A trillion people could wander all their lives without ever meeting one another. There's a character in this as well who was picked for the mission purely because she's statistically very lucky and it's, uh, you know, considered whether luck can be almost like a psychic trait. And this is like a recurring theme throughout as well, this person's luck. We get someone shouting, the world is flat! And then we get this which is a bit intense. 
Uh, so someone says, as a good luck charm, you're fired. Come on, smile, we need you. We need you to keep me happy so I don't rape Nessus. And this is interesting because uh, basically people aren't used to pain because the future. So um, somebody gets punched in the nose. It says, the blow was light for the hairy man was slight and his hands were fragile, but it hurt. Lewis was not used to pain. Most people of his century had never felt pain more severe than that of a stubbed toe. Anaesthetists were too prevalent. Medical help was too easily available. The pain of a skier's broken leg usually lasted seconds, not minutes, and their memory was often suppressed as an intolerable trauma. Knowledge of the fighting disciplines, karate, judo, jiu-jitsu, and boxing, had been illegal since long before Lewis Wu was born. Lewis Wu was a lousy warrior. He could face death, but not pain. And uh, it's interesting because the character who's known for being lucky, she's never stubbed her toe before. A great curse here. Lewis says, May you be the first victim of retroactive birth control. And uh, then we have some people singing, and this is cool. It says, He guessed they were singing a 12 toed scale. The octave scale of most of the human worlds was also a 12 toned scale, but with differences. Small wonder it had sounded flat to Teela. So, yeah. Uh, Overall, I like the concept of Ringworld. Uh, I think it's a really fascinating idea, and you know, I can see how you get a book out of it. Overall, the book itself was just fairly standard old school sci fi, um, nothing particularly special. It was very much the concept and a few of the ideas, like the character with the look, uh, and even things like I just read about uh, the guy that not used to experiencing pain and stuff. Little ideas like that were great. Overall, uh, the narrative was so-so. Um, just about kept my attention. I think if it had been any longer, I would have got bored of it. But uh, overall, I gave it, you know, middle of the road, 3.5 out of 5. So there we have it. That's what I made of Ringworld by Larry Niven. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.